We want to welcome everyone this morning to Gospel Lighthouse Ministries. We're having some inclement weather here in Kansas City, so we won't be broadcasting from the church, but we're going to broadcast right here live from DCF. And uh, I want to talk this morning about a subject. Um, ordinarily, this would be the Sunday school time, so this would be sort of the adult Sunday school uh, class. But I'm going to talk about Manasseh this morning, Manasseh. So. If you want to follow along with me, you're welcome to do that. All right. Our golden text this morning is, When he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Now that's 2 Chronicles 33 verse 12. Of course, our study outline is really broken down into three parts. It is Manasseh forsakes his godly heritage. Secondly, God pronounces judgment. And then third, Manasseh turns to God. Now, this is a very powerful story, uh, really a record that we have from the Old Testament that I think has a lot of application uh, value in modern times. So if you have your Bible this morning, I want to turn over to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 33, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 1 through 9. Now Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem. Now some uh, historians will tell us that he reigned for about 10 years as a co-regent with his father, Hezekiah. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places, which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he raised up altars for the Baals, and he made wooden images and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And he practiced soothsaying. He used witchcraft and sorcery. And he consulted mediums and spiritists, and he did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set up a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever." And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Now, that is a lot of information in nine verses, but it gives us an overview of the beginning of the life of Manasseh. Understand that he was raised to know the Lord. His father Hezekiah had been a good king. He had trained him up to know the Lord. Nevertheless, Manasseh did not take God seriously. We would say it today, he was raised in church. Um, he was raised to know the Lord. But there is evidence that Manasseh did not truly believe in God. Now, this happens a lot of times because young people, of course, when they're being raised up in church, um, they, they see a lot of things happening. They learn how to be a Christian, they learn the ways of God, but often they do not come personally into a relationship 
with God. Um, they never come to a place to where they truly know the Lord. And we're going to see this in the life of Manasseh. It's very powerful. But I want you to notice some things about him and some of the terrible deeds that he had done. First of all, he reversed the pattern that his God-fearing father, Hezekiah, had established. Um, it's almost as though he couldn't wait until his father had passed on or until he had come of age, till he came into control so he could begin doing things his way. And he was greatly, obviously, of a carnal, if not diabolical, mind. He rebelliously did the exact opposite of how he was raised. Okay, um, and, and a lot of times young people will do that. They will, they'll be raised up in church, they'll be raised to know the Lord, but nevertheless, they'll turn and do the exact opposite. Um, sometimes they become very cynical. Um, you know, they see things that aren't exactly the way that they ought to be, and they use these little incidents throughout their life a lot of times as an excuse or an occasion to just completely rebel against God. And that's what Manasseh did. Uh, he did the exact opposite of how he was raised. He forsook Jehovah, and rather he served the Baals or Balaam. Now, anytime that you have uh, a word in Hebrew that ends in ayim, ayim or yim, that denotes plural. So Baal is the singular, Balaam is the plural. Then he also served Asherah or Astaroth, or Ishtar, uh, she is sometimes known as, and then of course Moloch or Molech. And uh, we're gonna talk about those gods in a little bit. But there's a verse in Judges 2 verse 10, the end of that verse that is very telling, and I think it really speaks to the situation with Manasseh. And it reads like this, and also there arose another generation who knew not the Lord, neither the works that he had done in Israel. You see, young people can't live off their parents' experience. They can't live off their grandparents' experience. They can't live on the stories, okay? Um, they need to see the hand of God for themselves. They need to experience God. They need to experience the reality of God. And when God reveals himself, uh, then they are in position to truly if you will, take ownership of the God uh, and the religion of their fathers. But until then, oftentimes, children will behave more or less like Manasseh. Now, I want you to notice, now, of course, this section we have uh, entitled Manasseh Forsakes His Godly Heritage. I want you to notice some of the things that he, uh, he had done. He set up false gods in the very temple where Jehovah God had manifest himself and had put his holy name. Now, I want you to imagine um, this situation. Here, Solomon had built this temple. It was a magnificent place. He had dedicated it to the Lord. And upon dedication, the scripture tells us that the fire of God fell. The glory of God appeared in the temple so that the priests were unable to minister. So this was the power of God being manifest in his house, this place where he had chosen upon the earth at that time to reveal himself. And here you have Manasseh going in there, having already known that God said that you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make any graven images, and he set up these false gods in the very temple of God. Now, that is unconscionable. But that is the level of rebellion that Manasseh was moving in, okay? So people were still coming to the temple, and today we would kind of say it like this. They are still coming to church, but they were not worshiping the God of their fathers. And we're going to see exactly what they were worshiping. Um, this was a gross mixture, if I could say it this way, of the world with the things of God, okay? He was mixing the world with the things of God. He, he kept a lot of the, uh, the, the facilities. He kept a lot of the things that, um, th that had some connection with the past, but yet now he's brought in these false gods uh, rather than God. Now, I have this quote that uh, a brother 
um, from Facebook had posted this morning that I thought was very appropriate for what we're talking about, and it's, of course, A.W. Tozer. He said, worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ within us. And I think that's a very powerful truth. Now, keep in mind that A.W. Tozer died, I believe it was in the early 1960s. And I have often wondered what he would have to say about a lot of things today that are considered to be worship. Because in the 60s, things were very, very tame uh, compared to today. But worship is not worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ that is within us. Very powerful this morning. Amen. Now I want to first of all look at uh, three of the gods and I want to just kind of expand just a little bit on each one that Manasseh served. Now, first of all he served Baal or Baalim as it's known in the plural. Uh, now Baal was served generally speaking um, for the procurement of things. Um, people would serve Baal so that they could be prosperous or or experience financial or material prosperity, okay? And that's why they would worship him. So he would bless them. They would, uh, they believed if they worshiped Baal, then they would receive rain, their crops would grow, and there would be prosperity. And it's been said, so this is not original with me, but I believe it is true, nevertheless, that Baal, more or less, answers to the lusts of the flesh, okay? Uh, what does that mean? It's just the desire for things. People trying to find fulfillment and meaning in life by materialism, okay, by stuff. You know, you know the things that we get like we just received at Christmas, and then in a few months they're sitting out on the curb to go out to the trash, or maybe, uh, you know, cars, or properties, or houses, or jewelry, all these different types of things Okay, when a person is serving materialism, when they're serving material blessings, it is basically as if they were serving Baal. Now, a lot of people wouldn't think about bowing down to an idol like this bronze, uh, bronze figure that had been found, it had been dug up somewhere. Of course, this is one of many renditions of Baal uh, that dates back to around the 13th century um, B.C., uh, but they wouldn't bow to that. But nevertheless, people bow to materialism. Okay, they bow to things, and they are serving things rather than serving God. And this is basically what Manasseh was doing. Only he had taken it to the extent of actually worshiping that God. And then, secondly, he would have been worshiping Astarte or Ashtaroth, Ashtoreth, or Ishtar. Uh, she would have been known say, among the Babylonians or Assyrians. Now, this was a common sort of fertility, sexuality, war-type god that was worshipped in the Middle East. Um, in other words, when a person was trying to find fulfillment in illicit sexuality or illicit-type things that God has forbidden, okay, um, they would worship this false god. And um, it's amazing how some of these gods so, uh, I guess you can say, parallel the things that we find that John tells us are basically all that is in the world. And Astarte or Ashtaroth, Ishtar answers, I suggest, to the lust of the eye. When a person's trying to find fulfillment in in these types of things and sexuality. Um, they also did it, of course, because they may have wanted it, offspring, things of that nature. But um, that's what happens when a person goes to seed, if you will, trying to serve, uh, as one preacher said, the exercise of their glands, trying to find fulfillment in the exercise of their glands. And um, I think that's one of the things Manasseh was attempting to do. See, when you push God out of your life, you've got to have something in the void. And it's, it's going to be the same basic things that the enemy has always used against mankind. And thirdly, he served Moloch or Molech. Okay, This is basically just your 
Uh, in Hebrew, you don't have vowels, you only have consonants, so you have MLK, and um, however you want to pronounce that, Molech, Moloch. Uh, and this was a god that was served. Now, this is particularly heinous, and it almost defies humanity. Um, this would be a bronze uh, statue that would have been erected that was very large. It would have been hollowed out in the center. They would build a fire on the inside. And when the fire uh, began to go, now some of them actually had a tube that went out the back. Uh, so I've found in studies and research I've done, and it would draw air, oxygen, in from the back so it would begin to throttle okay, and the heat would become so intense that the arms of this false god would grow, glow red, okay, and um, then the people would take their firstborn sons, and God forbid, they would lay the child upon the arms of this glowing god, and um, the scripture calls this practice passing your children through the fire to Molech, okay, and the Scripture warns against this type of thing, but nevertheless, even though these people, as deranged as they are, okay, wanting to serve this god Molech or Moloch, worshiping him perhaps so that they could uh, go up in position in life, they wanted to maybe go from being the mayor to the governor, from the governor, if you will, to the president, uh, wanted to go from some person that had this sort of status to a higher status. They just wanted to move up, if you will, in society. They would worship Molech, okay? And they would sacrifice their firstborn in order to get this uh, accomplished. But again, these people weren't so uh, inhumane and deranged that they could just watch this happen. So they had people around uh, the perimeter that would beat drums uh, play timbrels and make noise, okay, to drown the screams of these children, okay? This is one of the first pictures that we have, or I say one of the first really vivid pictures that we have of hell in the Bible because, of course, Solomon originally set up uh, the worship of Molech in the Valley of Hinnom uh, in a place called Tophet, T-O-P-H-E-T, uh, tof, T-O-P-H, signifies drums. And uh, many scholars have concluded, which this wouldn't have been unusual at all when these types of um, ceremonies would be going on, that drums and things would be beaten, but that tof or tofet signifies the beating of drums. And the idea is that you're driving out of your mind, you're trying to drown out the consequences of what you're doing. Okay, people do that today. You probably already, your mind's probably already jumping to conclusions. You know, people today, they sacrifice their children. There's actually been books that are written that were likening abortion, for example, to the worship of Molech. People not wanting the child to really hinder their career, they would basically have an abortion. And these are the types of parallels that we could make uh, with the children of Israel worshiping Molech. Nevertheless, Molech answers, I believe, to the pride of life. Now, you will know that these are all things that are of the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but they are of the world. So, in a very literal sense, Manasseh brought all that is in the world into the house of God and began worshiping those things rather than God. Again, he kept the facility in place. He probably had some similar ceremonies, but make no mistake, he was not worshiping the one true God. Now, I just want to read to you 2 Chronicles 33, 10 and 11, because this is very telling. You see, when people get off the tracks, God is always faithful to try to deal with them. And I just want to read these verses to you. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. They would not listen. Okay. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks. Now, we'll come back to that in a minute, but I want to just say 
that the general consensus is that Manasseh not only killed many prophets, the scripture talks about his, the people's blood just running in the streets, okay? He had killed many prophets that God had sent to him. But worst of all, it is very likely that he killed Isaiah. Now you'll remember in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says they were stoned, they were sawn asunder. Okay, they were temp tempted, they were slain with the sword, so on and so forth. So it is very likely that Manasseh gave the order to have Isaiah sawn in two. Okay, now this is the level of rebellion that this man was moving in who was raised in church, if I can just say it that way. He was raised in the house of God. He was raised to know the, know the Lord but you see what people are capable of. Our former pastor, Brother Birch, he used to always say, you don't know what you're capable of if you get out from under the hand of God. And that is true. You would never think that you would persecute Christians. You would never think that you would try to kill folks, but that's exactly what Manasseh did. And not just kill anybody, killing someone on the level of an Isaiah. That's, that's unconscionable behave, behavior, but nevertheless. Now, again, notice what the scripture says. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks. Now, I've often wondered what that looked like. Took him with hooks, okay? That was a savage way of taking this king back to Assyria. He came in, he captured them. Now understand that the Assyrians were some of the most gruesome and mean people who ever lived. You think ISIS is capable of doing evil? They are, but the Assyrians would make ISIS blush. These people would cut off heads. They would stack them up like bowling balls. They would um, throw people off the, t uh, off the walls of the fortified cities onto spears to like shish kebabs horrific things that they would do, okay? So God didn't just send anybody to deal with Manasseh. When the Assyrians came, it was bad news. These people were so mean that once they did all these terrible things, killing folks, they would send their artists into like the, uh, the king's palace and write out or draw out, if you will, all the exploits of their armies on the walls so that when people came in to see the king, maybe there was a delegation from some certain country, they're going to do some negotiating. The thing they saw on the walls were all these horrific, what we would call today war crimes, all on the walls, all the way through the corridor. So you can just imagine the distress that Manasseh would have had to have been in. Now in our picture here, uh, you see one of the Assyrians fighting with the lion. He's got him by the throat. He's sticking him through the body. I mean, this was the type of reputation that they tried to project towards people. I've actually seen these reliefs at the British Museum, uh, and they are, they are amazing to look at. But this, this is the type of people that we're talking about. And that's who took hold of Manasseh, bound him up with chains, put him in prison, and it was at this point that Manasseh, and if I can use some New Testament language, began to come to himself, okay? And unfortunately, a lot of times that's the way it is. You can talk and talk and talk until you're blue in the face. God sent prophet after prophet after prophet. And I guarantee you, every one of them men were speaking with a powerful unction from God. When they would speak, it probably thundered inside of Manasseh. But nevertheless, he kept resisting everything that was being said. But when God unleashed the Assyrians on him, and they drug him back, put him in a state of, of, of just absolute torment and torture, Manasseh was humbled, and he humbled himself before the Lord. Now I want you to notice this here. Verse 12. Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God 
of his fathers. And he prayed to him, and he received his entreaty, and he heard his supplication, and he brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Okay, so God heard Manasseh's prayer. Now you would think that after doing all of the horrific things that Manasseh had done, I mean, he had taken blaspheming God to a whole new level. I mean, he had taken uh, things into the temple, things that we would have thought that most men would be struck dead for doing. But see, God is long-suffering. And even though he knew better, I mean, Manasseh knew better. If there was anyone who knew better, it was him. But he kept doing these things. But God was long-suffering to him. And God heard his prayer. Now, I want you to notice something here. Very powerful. 2 Chronicles 33, verse 13, the bottom section. Then, let's emphasize then, then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. See, you notice that. And I suggest to you again, as I suggested in the beginning, that Manasseh really probably never believed in God. When he would hear the stories of miracles in his ears, they were just stories. They were just fables. He'd probably say, yeah, 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 whatever. Roll his eyes, all that kind of stuff. But when he was in chains, when he was in shackles, when he was locked up, when he had been drawn away out of his comfort zone by hooks, okay, uh, into the Assyrian land, then he cried out to God, and God performed a miracle. And it was at that point in Manasseh's life that he knew that God was the Lord, okay? He had a personal experience with God. And a lot of times that's what has to happen, okay? God has to bring a person to the place to where they are humble enough to look up to him and be to give him their undivided attention so that they can see, understand, and appreciate the hand of God. And when God got Manasseh's attention, he showed himself to him, and then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. And it was a life-altering experience for him, okay? It was life-altering. Um, it was like he was determined that he was going to do whatever he could not to serve the God of his fathers. He was going to chart a different course. He was going to rebel. He was going to do a different thing. But God still had his hand on him. And undoubtedly, there were prayers that were prayed, many things. But nevertheless, in God's sovereignty, he got a hold of Manasseh. And that is a powerful, powerful story. Now, at that point, we may just say, well, everything was good. He lived happily ever after. Well, he went back. He began to build the walls. He set up fortifications. He got rid of all the false gods out of the land. Uh, he didn't tear down the groves, but he, or the high places rather, but he took the thing out. He began to worship the Lord, and he tried his best uh, for the rest of his life to go back and serve God the way he is raised, the way he knew was the right way to do. But I have to tell you, that the damage that was done by Manasseh, okay, could not be undone. He had instituted false gods, and we'd say it today, worldliness, worldliness into the church. He had introduced all these things into the church, and then when he finally repented, when he finally came to himself, when his mind sobered up, and he truly knew the Lord, he tried to change it. He tried to go in and get rid of those things. He tried to tell the people, this isn't the right way. I've led you astray. He even commanded them to serve God. But nevertheless, the scripture tells us, and I just want to read this verse because it is very, very powerful. Verse 15, he took away the foreign gods and the idols from the house of the Lord. Verse 16, he also repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed Peace offerings, verse 17, nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. The compromise that still remained after Manasseh, that, that seed 
that root of compromise that he had introduced back into the people that was not completely uprooted, if you will. Uh, he tried his best apparently to do it, but it was still there. And it would continue to grow, okay, for the next several generations until ultimately um, God would destroy um, by the Babylonians Jerusalem, the temple would be destroyed. It would be torn down and plowed under like a farmer would plow his field. And uh, as a matter of fact, God warned him. He said that I'm going to wipe Jerusalem like a person wipes a plate and turns it over when they're done. See, this is the level of judgment that God was warning of. It didn't happen in the years of Manasseh. Manasseh went on uh, and he died and he passed on and then his son was raised up to rule in his place. But we have to understand that rebellion always has a consequence, okay? It may not be seen in your generation, but you are setting the stage for an eventual total collapse of the things of God. And that's why it's important. I've observed this uh, over the course of my life that a lot of times, especially people, and I'm not being, I'm not being mean or facetious or anything like that, but a lot of times when people are raised in church, they don't have an adequate appreciation of the holiness of God, and they don't think anything of bringing worldly things into the house of God, just like Manasseh did. And eventually, as they grow older, they may change their mind. They, God may reveal himself he begins, they begin to see that what they had done was error. But because that has been introduced in the church, there is almost no way to go back. And it sets us on a path of total destruction. And it can set us on a path for apostasy. And this is a great warning. The Bible said that these things were written for our learning. And they are given to us for our admonition. Okay? That's why God gave us these stories, and they are very powerful. So what is the moral of the story? Well, the moral of the story is this, is that when we know to serve the Lord, we need to do right. And we need to recognize that rebellion always has a consequence. And you may find repentance. You may try to straighten things out once you see the light, if you will. But nevertheless, the damage is already done. And they, uh, Manasseh couldn't go back and straighten up everything that he had messed up, even though he did uh, get his heart back right with the Lord. Just some very, very powerful things that I hope that we can consider this morning. Well, God bless you. I want to just pray before we go uh, this morning, before we sign off. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful to gather together this morning, Lord, and for all who may have been um, listening in today, Lord, it is my prayer that the story of Manasseh would ring true in our hearts in this age of compromise, in this age of worldliness, when the world is closing in on every side, trying to introduce everything under the sun into the worship of God uh, except the one true God. Lord, it is my prayer that people may be hearing this in the, in the privacy of their own home or maybe in their car will truly think about these things and let them sink down into their ears, Lord. And Lord, we just pray a special blessing upon each and every person that your word would find a lodging place in their heart. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. God bless you.